here's my final admonition, my charge to you, Timothy, because it's really important, and I'm charging you before the Lord. It's not just a polite, you know, encouragement. I'm really, this is serious. I believe God is what, the Lord is watching me as I charge you. What I want you to do, verse 2, preach the words in season and out of season. When it's convenient, and it's not convenient. When things are easy, and things are not easy. Preach the words. And as you preach the word, you convince, that is you bring conviction, persuasion, assurance of the hearts of people. You rebuke, which means to lovingly correct, bring correction in the lives of people. You exhort, which means to encourage, motivate, inspire people. But do this. With all long suffering and teaching, that means you be very patient in your teaching. Why? Because the time will come, he said, that people would not be interested in sound doctrine. They're no longer going to be interested in sound teaching from the word. And instead, they would like to listen to people who will tickle their ears. <laughs> And make them happy and make them feel good about what they hear. And they're going to flock to these kinds of teachers. And they're going to heap up these kinds of teachers. And they're going to refuse the truth. That's verse 4. They're going to refuse the truth and instead embrace fables. In verse 5, he says, but you be watchful in all things. I mean, you be careful. You endure afflictions. You stand through tough times, hardships. You endure it. Do the work of an evangelist. That means you keep speaking the good news of Jesus Christ. And you fulfill your ministry. You complete your ministry. You complete the assignment God's given you. Now just think about the dangers. What would happen if we replace the truth with fables? If we replace sound doctrine with things that please people's ears. What will happen? Just try to think about it. We would lose out on everything that God wants to bring into our lives through His Word. So he says, Timothy, I know I'm going to be sacrificed. My life is going to be offered up. Death is imminent now. I'm in prison under Nero. I know my departure is at hand. But there is such a sense of completeness, such a sense of satisfaction. Look at the words he says here. He says, I have fought a good fight. There's a deep sense of accomplishment. I have finished the race. Sense of completion. I have kept the faith and ful fulfilled. And there's a sense of expectation. There's a crown laid up for me. Verse 16 through 18. He says, At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. Now think about that. So Paul is reflecting on what took place two years prior when he was first in prison in Rome. And, you know, he waited in Rome for two years. Finally, his turn came and he was brought before Nero. And when he was put on trial, Paul says, all forsook me. No one stood with me. Now, what would your reaction be if you were in Paul's place? And you found that, hey, all the people who were your close associates, your close friends, people that you traveled with, who worked with you, in the moment of your greatest trial, no one's around. They all forsook. Normal response would be to hold some resentment, hold something against these people. But what does Paul say? May it not be charged against them. Meaning, Nothing against them. My heart is clean. But look at what Paul testifies. He says in verse 17, But the Lord stood with me. He says, you know, when nobody else stood with me, God was there. The Lord stood with me and strengthened me. God gave me the strength. God was there. When I had to stand alone, God was with me. He strengthened me. And what else did he do? Through me, while I was on trial, he made sure the gospel went all across in that courtroom. So that the Gentiles, the Romans, would hear about Jesus.